Hello, uh, this is Return of Utter Shambles. Uh, it's a slightly different Utter Shambles than normal. Before you start listening to this, if you have them in the house, why not get a banana, an olive, a pudding and a custard cream? We'll tell you more as Utter Shambles continues. But anyway, let's find out what happened in the studio when Dave Gorman, Josie Long and Robin Itz all met up. The, is there um, a theme or is there a thing? Hello. Do I need to know anything? Hello, welcome to uh, Utter Shambles podcast. That was uh, Dave Gorman talking. Hello. There. Hello. Uh, he was wondering if there was a theme for the Utter Shambles. So there's not a shit theme for the Utter Shambles podcast. This is the first one we've done for a while. Uh, we've got Josie Long's back. Hello, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here. Good, yes. I have been auditioning others, but no one has had the correct level of ramshackle and passion. Some have been ramshackle, some have been overly passionate, but the mix was absolutely perfect. And uh, I'm as I said, I'm still on the team. Dave Gorman here. Dave Gorman's actually telling Josie how to write her book. Where have we got to? Hang on, hang on. Well, no, <laughs> sorry, no, not... No, no, that suggests that I've sat down here and said, now, listen here, young Long, let me tell you about the art of book writing, which is nothing of the sort happened. I asked for advice, and it was very helpful. Well, you, you've hit deadline. You're, you're deadline panic, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely um, stultified with panic. I feel sick. I, I open up my folder with all the chapters in, and I look at the first chapter, and then I think, am I going to vomit or cry? I don't know which one, but one's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. So Am I going to cry vomit? <laughs> oh, it won't work. But I'll I'm... tell you this, though. In the same way, and people say this about sort of giving birth, and I, uh, I imagine it's probably some kind of emotionally similar, obviously not on the same scale, but similar process. About a week after you've handed in the final manuscript, or in fact maybe, maybe a day or two after it's finally published, you will forget that you were ever in this emotional state and you will look at it and you'll feel really proud and and you'll think oh. I want to do that again <laughs> oh yeah oh I, I didn't did you not get that, that at all I did enjoy I was just in, in Glastonbury uh, with, with Josie as well and I did enjoy uh, I went past there's a lovely kind of remainder bookstall there really good quality remainders and uh my, my book was there for £2.99. Uh, there was only one copy. I said, well, if you haven't sold it uh, tomorrow, at the end of the gig, I'll say, if anyone wants to sign copy of our book, just follow me. There's one over here. And then this man actually went, he went, um, is there another copy? And they went, no, it's the last one. He went, oh, I wanted to get it. And I went, no, you can have this one. It just saves me doing the walk tomorrow. <laughs> and then he was looking around and he went, wow, they've got my book too. And the guy <laughs> bought my book. And it was this great big book about uh, the nature of archaeology and a sense of evolution, a lot of very you know, interesting, highfalutin, but academic essays. Yeah. And I went, I'm so sorry, because it's very nice you bought mine, but I'm afraid we're not going to do a swapsies by here. Because... Uh, I've got too many books anyway. You and could have this, bought yeah. that and given it away to somebody. Didn't need to tell him that. Right, mine was two ninety nine. His was eight ninety nine. I have never been a good capitalist, but I'm beginning to learn. <laughs> That's definitely not. A, you don't want to do swapses with that. I get annoyed by at festivals. I always end up buying some people's collections of poetry that I don't really want. I don't like poetry even when it's really good. Uh, and I always end up some, and you think, oh, they're a poet. They're probably really struggling, and you know that. So now we're on to poetry, yes. which is what you, Dave Gorman, began as. Yes, uh, sort of. Really, uh, sort you of, were yeah. kind of a. Because I, I mean, this may yeah. well have been well chronicled. No, because, no, not really. Because um, you did on the Manchester scene, which you began in. Would it have been 1990, 91? Uh, I was nineteen when I started, so that would have been ninety. Uh, just called yeah. from your agent, said, uh, could you say you were 15 when you started? Because currently they're saying you're younger when pitching you to television. Do you know, that's just not true. I've, I'm so straight up and honest. Apart from the fact that my real name isn't Dave Gorman, everything about me is entirely true. What's your real name? Are we it is Dave Gorman, really. Aww. I was being silly. Um, mm-hmm. uh, no, yes, I'm I did. So I started gullible. off as a, a sort of comic poet. I was very, very inspired by John Hegley and Henry Normal, uh, the two of them, whose shows I used to see in Edinburgh every year and, and got very excited by. I'm sorry to interrupt. Henry Normal used to be a performance poet. Yes, he did. And now he's a TV producer. Yeah. Gosh, how interesting. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Back to where we were. Uh, no, and he, he was he was brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, so I sort of crafted something, sort of. I partly it's because I was 19, mm. and so I had no life experience to draw on, nothing to actually talk about. So all I really discussed was words, because I had the sort of the 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 now to to craft some humour out of words, but not based on anything that came from my heart or my head or experience or anything. And so I did a kind of fairly sort of deadpan... It, it, was, it wasn't really poems, they were jokes with pauses in. Mm. But part of the joke was, I'm taking this very seriously. <laughs> it is a poem. And then, you know, half sometimes the punchline would be, and now I'm turning the page, which means you've realised it's over. And that was your cue to stop and think and go, ah, about it. So I did that, and then um, a few... I'd been doing it a little while, and it was sort of going okay... And I got booked by a guy to support John Hegley oh. at a gig in Stockport. And John was my hero, completely. 
And I said to him, no, you don't want to book me for that. That's ridiculous. You can't put me on before him. That's just... I'm, I'm, a, I'm a thin tribute act to his genius. And the guy was like, no, no, I think it'll be a great mix. And I ended up... I mean, obviously, I needed every gig I could get. I needed the money and stuff. So I ended up saying, look, I'll do it, but I'm telling you now that if I do it, I won't do any poetry. It will, I'll, I'll write something else to do it. Uh, and so we shook hands on that and three months later I turned up at that gig supporting John Hegley and I had a whole set without poetry and I never did another poem on stage again I wow. kind of like that was my right drawing a line under that no so more that John was your character influence. act really then wasn't it because that's what because yeah. a lot of people do start as a character act yeah. and well I was hiding because I was yeah. 19 yeah. so I, I was hiding behind insecurity and I was doing that slightly I was deadpan because I thought if I look like I don't care then when it goes badly I look like it hasn't hurt me and there's a kind of protection in that. There's a safety in that. And when it worked, it went really, really well. And when it didn't work, I had that kind of hard face, yeah, I don't care, sort of posturing mm. thing mm. going on. And then slowly, as you get older, you discover that actually caring helps it go well. Yeah. And yeah. Show, you know, showing that you care helps it to go well. And you cut out a lot of those nights it doesn't go well, don't mm. go badly. So you kind of, I, I had to sort that out. But I was 19. I was, I was a child. Did you have a point where you see Josie with you when I first worked with you and you, you had a, a sellotape tattoo on your tummy? I did. And, I was uh, 16. That was when I was 16. I was 16, 16 or 17. Yeah. No, I remember. I saw, really I saw really one of your very, very early days. You were very young. I've <laughs> never kind of seen, I, I mean, I've seen you change and all that kind of stuff, but you've always kind of been roughly what you are on stage to a certain extent. You've developed and you've changed obviously because you got older and you were a teenager. Whereas I feel there was a point where you think, oh, I think I used to just be playing the part of a comedian and then you kind of learn to be yourself on stage. I'll tell yeah. you what the difference was. was I'm sorry, I'm eating a banana. I'm going to stop. Um, I think one of the things that has marked out this as a podcast is the fact that it's very rarely that you don't snack little, during the little podcast, but always healthily. Mm, I, I like to think I'm giving people just small, subtle messages about Subliminal, healthy eating. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think the difference is I hadn't seen... <laughs> in fact, seen... if this was an old film in the 1950s where they used to flash up signals, it would say, like, if it was Odorama, even, the polyester thing, where it flashed up a number saying scratch number two now. At home now, what we actually flash to is, eat banana now. <laughs> eat banana now. Um, no, what I was going to say was, I don't think I'd really seen much stand-up when I started stand-up. I'd seen a lot of, like, I liked Vic and Bob and Monty Python and Lee and Herring... And that's all I'd really seen. So for me, it was just like, be chaotic and exuberant, do whatever you want. And it wasn't kind of like, I'm pissed off at the world, you know? So I didn't have a persona to inhabit. I just had like, I'll just do whatever I can come up with. I'll just do what I was mucking around at school doing and bring that and do that. And um, yeah. I think there is a thing where some people just... Because I saw you when you were 16 doing a gig and you had a huge amount of self-confidence and you were very much yourself you inhabited your your own self on stage thank you but you did but that that happens to different people at different ages and at 19 i wasn't very sort of emotionally developed at 19 i was still very much a child you know in my first year of university when that i wasn't yet a, a proper grown-up and it does like i remember at school i never got the smiths for example like something i got when i was older and i think that is partly to do with a kind of a lack of emotional development mm. you know so at the age of 13 and 14 when everyone else is being a troubled teenager i wasn't you were just a bit i was like, quite happy and sort of just sort of cruising through it and so i wasn't into that and then it was later on when i got that and i think i think you need a little bit of angst in your life to get that mm. you know and i didn't have it at the age when everyone else did and so that came later and and so did me becoming myself on stage mm. I just started on stage when I was stupidly young and not quite ready for it. There's no point in doing stand-up unless you're wrapped with self-loathing and always forcing, you know, kind of the, the possibility of getting approbation from others. It's entirely <laughs> pointless thing. You can have a normal job where every single night you don't go, why am I doing this? I feel sick. <laughs> Walking off stage after lots of people giving you a round of applause and laughed at you and gone, I imagine some of those people really hated me and they'll probably tweet something about me. <laughs> uh, if you're emotionally held, I mean, we're all very glad you had some form of breakdown, obviously, in your late teens. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise yeah. it would never have worked out. Please don't tell me you really had one. Um, with comedy and music, I think this is one of the big differences. With... Uh, when you say to a, when you say a band, who are your influences? What the question means is, who do you sound a bit like? Yeah. And if someone goes, oh, you know, we're really influenced by the Bee Gees and the Fall, you go, what? What kind of weird hybrid is that? And you you try to imagine, and normally you can kind of get close to what a band sounds like by hearing two bands they say are their influences. You know, normally it's like that. You know, it's more likely to be the Beach Boys and something or whatever. And what then a band that they sound. don't really like, but they know they should mention. I mean, yeah. I suppose you know the, the Smiths, but also very much the MC Five. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's your favourite do... MC Five? The Smiths and Lama. Which one? But I... in comedy, when you say your influences, 
it, it's a ridiculous, it's awful to say, oh, I'm really influenced by, you know, Bill Bailey and so and so, and therefore I sound like them. Because that's the lesson to learn from your influences in comedy is that they've found their own thing. Mm. And you've got to find your own thing. There's no such thing as going, oh, I'm going to sound a little bit like, I'm going yeah. to, I'm really influenced by Stephen Wright. I'll try and be like Stephen Wright meets Paul Merton. It yeah. doesn't make any sense at all. The people that I feel, yeah, the influence that I feel that I've got from people is um, be more daring, be more brave. Yeah, uh, but it's not sound like them, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, that's the kind I just of... was thinking of um, the Bee Gees singing The Fall when I was trying to do it, but I couldn't do it. Like, walking down now. <laughs> I've got Mitch Ben's number. Hang on. There we go. I also want to say, you do a radio show with Danielle Wood. And yes. um, in 2003, when I was but 21 years old, she was wearing an MC5 T-shirt. And I said, what's that? And she said, it's a Scottish Five tribute band. <laughs> and I believed her. I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't know anything about the world. <laughs> She's See, we're a very sassy a nice, woman. A nice, well, in fact, that's the nice thing is because you used to share a flat with Danielle and you were very in good Edinburgh friends with her. With and uh, Martin White used to be my musical arranger. Yeah. And then there was a hostile takeover. And Dave Gorman. He bought them uh, out. Both them. Both yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. For, uh, I did tell, uh, which you, you are, This will you can mention this on your radio show before we, because this won't go out before then. Uh, I was telling Dave one of my favourite things that Martin ever did. I took him to the Hay Festival because I know he likes a treat. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I took him there. And we were at the great thing about the Hay Festival is when you're waiting at the station, you're suddenly going, Oh, there's one of my favourite authors, or there's, you know, there's, there's such yeah. a weird mix of people. Oh, there's Will Self. And uh, this time there was, it was like Will Self, but like an older Will Self. It was Martin Amis, in fact. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and so I just happened to mention, because Dave today was uh, getting a visa for America, and I said, Oh, well, actually, last time I was there, I was behind Martin Amis, who looked furious at the fact that he had to be there at five to seven <laughs> when he's Martin Amis. <laughs> um, we met at the station, I went, Oh, hello. I said, you, we, we almost met so we briefly spoke to each other when we were waiting to get a visa at five, uh, seven in the morning and then Martin came over and he likes Martin Amos and, and he went hello my name's Martin too oh! and, then, and then afterwards he went he was just there for the whole of the journey the 40 minute journey to the station to, to, you just see him going oh, there's no problem even trying to talk to Martin Amos now because why do I say to Martin Amos I mean you might as well have said that to <laughs> Philip Larkin you know my name's Philip too <laughs> <laughs> and it was such a great moment because I I think so everyone's cute. done that. Yeah. I mean, if you, Dave, have you done that thing where you have gone up to someone who you think, oh, this 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 person has been influenced by, or just mm. someone you admire as well, and you think, well, I, I need to talk to them. Maybe you're at a party, and you think, oh, wow, I'm at a party with this person. What should be my opening gambit? And then your logical brain is suddenly usurped by something in the id, which just kicks out all logic and ruins everything. Yep. Yes, and I'm trying to think of an example, because I know I... Um, it would have been in Aspen, Colorado, when I was doing the festival there. There were, you know, sort of Larry David was in the room, and there were, you know, there were some amazing people around. Uh, but I can't, I honestly can't think of what I specifically said. But I know at one point when I was uh, waiting backstage to go and collect a thing, uh, and I was sort of Hank Azaria was talking to me, and I was already a little bit freaked by that. And then I, I went up to someone and and just sort of went. I really like what you do. I don't want to take any more of your time and walked away. Kind of, I didn't give him a oh. chance to respond to me. Um, so there was that kind of thing. My my celeb spotting when I went to the embassy today was not as highfalutin as yours. I think this defines the difference between us. When you go to an embassy, Martin, uh, uh, um, Robin, you will see Martin Amis. I went to the American embassy today. I saw three celebrities. It was quite a high, it's an incredibly high hit rate mm. uh, for one visit to an embassy. I saw Liz Hurley. Not I bad. saw Jeremy Kyle. No, you uh, did not. Yes, I did. What's he going to America? No, he, he might just be going for a trip and he's going to do an interview there or something with someone. He and, might not be getting a job out there. And oh. I saw Cheryl Cole. Wow. That's amazing. That is a remarkable threefer, isn't it? Isn't that... That's, that's basically high-end. all of British life. <laughs> isn't it just... Yes. In one fell swoop. All three social stratas. It's got everything. Um, I would like to say to people listening there is a wonderful video that someone has auto-tuned some Jeremy Carl it's called Sexual Contact it's by Alex Vegas I think um, I'd just like to recommend it you uh, listeners because it's both beautiful and funny and sad that's all I would like so to say which uh, you, you, should, you should see Tom Rigglesworth live for his discussion of Jeremy Kyle Oh, He's a, a fine comic who once was in the audience at a Jeremy Carr recording and has a lovely story about it. But it is his to tell, and so I would urge you to go and seek him out live. My friend Izzy was also in the audience of Trisha, and she recounts it by saying that she asked a question and then pulled this face, which I'll do for you guys, which was... 
<laughs> right, just <laughs> people in there, we'll need to take a photo of the face Josie oh, just no. did and put it on the website, just so you know, otherwise that won't work. It was um, sort of... Um, you do the face again and see if the listeners get a better idea. Well, I, I'll describe the face as best I can. It's sort of the face that Oliver Hardy would do as he fiddled with his tie, only without fiddling with his tie. There was a sort of mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm, thing yeah. that went with it. That's yeah. That's how she would have. Very pleased, my son is now into Lauren Hardy, so that's uh, well done. It's taken one year of using very similar techniques to those seen in a Clockwork Orange, <laughs> but now <laughs> da, 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 da 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 And then he starts crying. No, he doesn't. He does genuinely like them. The, um, so that was now. What about you? You must have had a. Uh, uh, an oh, experience God. where well actually more than one you must do it all Too the time because that's the great thing about you because that's what I like about you is that you would you wouldn't necessarily put the brakes on no if you could just gosh. lose the bit afterwards where you then go why did I do that I hate myself um I met Graham Coxon at the weekend at your show yeah. he was milling around by the backstage of the theatre and cabaret and I went up to him and didn't go like hi or anything I just went are you looking for Robin and he was like um no not really I'm I will be in a minute and then I was like because I know where Robin is, so I can find Robin. And then he went, my girlfriend and I are just waiting. As if I was trying to come on. And I wanted to be like, you're Graham Coxon. Okay. Mm. This, this is not me coming <laughs> on to you. You're Graham Coxon. Okay. Right. We right. both so can see So you came on to Graham Coxon. What, what else did you... No. You must have shown yourself up a few I times to Glastonbury, didn't you? I showed myself up all the time. My I friend met Billy Lindsay Bragg. Got, uh, so yeah. kind to me. My, my friend Lindsay got uh, touched. Uh, her nose was touched by Billy Bragg. He uh, gave me a hug. And uh, she was very... Com- I probably shouldn't mention it. It doesn't matter. She's very composed. But you know when you see someone, you go, well, you're very composed. When someone... You know, when someone really... You know when you've been touched by someone that you really yeah, respect? Yeah, yeah. And uh, she's very composed. But inside, I could see her going... <laughs> It was great. It was a really nice thing to watch. <laughs> the worst is when it, you, you're actually not doing that, but someone thinks you are doing that, and then you dig yourself into a hole trying to explain mm. that you're not being that person. So mm. I did a thing, because of the radio show, I did a thing where I introduced uh, Roger Daltrey at the Albert Hall as part of the Teenage Cancer Trust gigs. And Roger had been in and done an interview with me at the radio station and stuff, and, and he was, he's a really live wire, dead easy to interview, because he's a little cockney diamond, and he's just asking one question, and he goes off on one, and he's fantastic. And he got loads of time to think of your next question, and he's no trouble at all, and he's really alive, and, and he's great. And then I got asked to come and, and be at the Albert Hall and go on and, and introduce him. Uh, and so I was with these people who work for the Teenage Cancer Trust, and they had a couple of teenagers whose lives have been affected by cancer and, and have been helped by the Teenage Cancer Trust. And what happens is that they go on stage and they make a, a kind of they talk about their experience before the, the band comes on. And it's they're incredibly confident. A little part of you sits there watching them going, God, I hate you. How, that's out, how dare you at 15 be able to talk to this many people with that confidence that's outrageously <laughs> wrong and then you realise you know there's other things to not <laughs> to, to take that away from you but anyway so I, I went on to I was in the corridor with a couple of people who worked for the charity and a couple of kids who'd been affected by cancer and helped by the Teenage Cancer Trust and one of the people who worked for the charity sort of went Oh, I think maybe because Rogers, he, he's genuinely really hands on with the with the charity. He goes to the buildings. He's helped, you know, got really really involved in. He books those shows every year, and he's really wow. really properly. He's the man picking up the phone and whatever. And he he meets a lot of the kids. And somebody said, "Oh, maybe Roger would like to to meet you before he goes on. You know, I'll see what we can do." And then Roger comes out, and he's got his sort of headphones in, and he's got his minder with him, and he's pacing. And this woman goes up and sort of speaks to the minder. And we kind of get a message, no, he's not, He's in his space. He's getting ready for his gig, you know. Mm. He's, he's not to be disturbed. So we're all incredibly cool about that. It was a woman from the charity went up to the star and said, would you mind meeting these kids? And the message, it hasn't even got to Roger. It hasn't even got as far as him. Somebody else has said, no, it's not a good idea right now. He's getting himself in the zone and walked away. Everyone is incredibly reasonable about that. No one is casting any aspersions on Roger Daltrey. He goes to these places. He meets them all the time. He's very hands-on. He's not being starry. He's allowed to try and get in the zone five minutes before he goes on to the Royal Albert Hall to sing the songs from, from Tommy. I mean, of course he is. It's entirely reasonable. But then... I'm sort of waiting to go on. I'm a bit nervous. I'm about to go on stage and, and introduce Roger Daughtry at the Royal Albert Hall. I, you know, I'm not used to doing gigs of that scale and it's unusual and whatever. So I'm sort of a bit nervous. And then his minder keeps coming up to me and saying, look, he's not doing it, all right. And there's no way of me saying, I know, I'm not trying to get him to do anything. The more I say, the more I protest, the more it looks like I'm going, oh, please let me meet Roger <laughs> Daughtry. And I did, there was absolutely no way. Eventually I had to walk away from it knowing that that minder thinks I'm a sad fan 
who would like nothing more in the world than to meet Roger Daltrey. And was a little bit upset today because the, every time I went, no, no, it's all right, I'm not trying to. He went, yeah, yeah, look, he's not doing it, all right. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but I, I'm not trying to. I just want you to let know that I know. Yeah, look, I've told you, he's not bloody doing it. I know. Eventually, you've got no choice. That man thinks I'm a wanker. Well, I, I remember that when the star reported that story, she said, are you Dave Gorman? <laughs> well, piss off then. <laughs> Which was, uh, I feel, a quite rude you know take. You can't explain yeah, yeah. to someone it's that like, you're not doing that. It's like if you haven't forgotten somebody's name, but they think you have. Yes. And then you have to be like, no, no, I really didn't. I was just about to, it's just the way that I was behaving was, no, no. And they're like, no, it's fine. It's really fine. And you can't get out of that. Once yeah. you get to the, no, it's fine. It's like... We're boned. This interaction is ruined. See, I think it could have been worse. I think you could have done that, what can I do? And you do the over counter act going, I don't even like the Who. I think they're shit. <laughs> uh, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I saying that? The who? To, now the mind is crossing another way. This is... Uh, there's, uh, in fact, he talked about it on this uh, uh, show that Michael Legg, uh, a friend of ours, yes. uh, you obviously know Michael, yes. just listen if you have uh, <laughs> Michael's inability to, he always screws up whenever he gets anywhere near Robin Hitchcock, right? He's a huge fan of Robin Hitchcock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and uh, including the point where once he's in San Francisco at a hotel and his wife's going, oh, yeah, yeah, I know why we're here, just so you can see the soft boys, yeah? And so he goes, no, no, do you know what? I, I couldn't care about the The soft boys, uh, they're shit, they're shit. Uh, oh, there's Robin Hitchcock. <laughs> yeah, and this is. So there are. I, I think and actually you got away with a, a minder. Perhaps has a slightly. Le- but then again, once you went on and introduced, well, hopefully that would have all fallen into place. I don't know. I don't know. But at the same time, you think. Okay. Did you introduce him as? And now a very rude man who hates <laughs> ill children. No, I don't I'm... know why he's doing this. Why am I saying this? <laughs> it's the Albert Hall. Weirdly, I got the instruction just before I went on that I wasn't actually allowed to introduce him. So what I had to do was sort of uh, there'd been a support act, and then uh, then then there were these kids, and I had to sort of you know go through the machinations of that was and and these people are and stuff, and then sort of enjoy your evening. I wasn't allowed to say, ladies and gentlemen, Roger Daltrey. Why he not? wanted no introduction. It was the minder was doing he that. To... <laughs> the clever, clever minder. No, no. no, it seems Dave Gorman never turned up, Mister Daltrey. <laughs> I'll have to do it. <laughs> no, what? he was he was doing a thing, and it was it was an amazing gig. And uh, but he was doing the songs from Tommy, and all of it, including little weird inter- interstitial moments that you'd never really thought were, you know, that you wouldn't miss if they weren't on the soundtrack. The whole thing wow. with these animations behind, and it was. This, this man is getting on and my life his lungs are amazing and he fills that room and he's got a load of personality and they had some amazing people coming in guesting on guitar and whatever and it was, it was just a bit it wasn't like a rock and roll gig it was like a theatrical event wow. and he wanted to start from like lights down lights yeah. up he's on stage rather than ovation and whatever it's like when I'm doing a preview at like the Positively 4th Street with like 30 <laughs> people and somebody mm. says this next act is bringing a show to Edinburgh and the show is called this and I think well actually at the start I was going to say that the show was called this and that's really going to cost me a minute and a half <laughs> um, it's like that really it is exactly like that yeah yeah <laughs> now yes. you normally just have that person you employ to come on who just says in a questioning way ladies and gentlemen a woman <laughs> <laughs> and then you come on it's all very enigmatic <laughs> and very exciting the, um, it's alright we don't need to worry about that now because the film Bridesmaids has proved once and for all finally it has settled the debate oh, if I hear any <laughs> more is, the worst you know, is it better than Bride Wars no, of course, yeah. is it better than Bride Wars um, in terms of the women thing I am really starting to appreciate how much it's wearing me down now because I've been doing this for 12 years you'd think I'd be good haha ha. Um, but I am uh it's wearing me down every single day having to have my legitimacy called into question and if I read one more time X proves once and for all the women are funny I will it's... find the journalist involved and I will poke one of their eyes out with my thumb well, one of if them if it's a man do a gender reassignment operation with that kit you bought off the internet which frankly does not look hygienic 29 quid yeah <laughs> uh, the, but the, I mean the, the thing is that it doesn't matter I, I think you it's notice not it anyway, it's not but it's also because any any lazy label will be used you will have had lazy labels used yeah. on you oh I, what was I the first get... box that you were put in forever forever uh, no no but you know what it is like the first show you do people go you're that word and then you'll still have it now. People will be like, so you're that word. And in your shows, you look for people with your name, don't well, you? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that is a one in itself. The fact that uh, there was a show about namesakes. There was a thing, like, so I did, this is over 10 years ago now, a show where I met namesakes. and It was a brilliant show. And I never said it was all namesakes ever. It was a particular, and then it was over. And then it was on TV. And I got offered so many spin-offs from it. Like, short, you know, short 
well-paid things. Turning up at a sitcom, somebody, ding dong, open the door, and it's me saying, hello, is there anyone here called Dave Gorman? And they go, no, there isn't, shut the door. That kind of like weird cameos and odd sort of merchandise, T-shirts and all those sort of things. And I turned them all down. Mm -hmm. And I turned them all down because it was a true story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah, yeah. And I was telling you a true story. If I then turn up being a pretend Dave Gorman hunter with a pretend obsession, I'm, I'm asked, it's that kind of David Dickinson thing of he realised that saying cheap as chips made people like him. So all of a sudden, six months after he was a lovable eccentric on TV, mm. he's that annoying wanker going, cheap as chips, cheap as chips, cheap as chips, cheap as chips. Mm. And you can see that it's a calculating decision. But, but that would have been really bad for you as a creative person as well. Well, that's, yeah, so, so I, I said no to all of that and I turned down t-shirt deals, anything that was like, anything that suggested I was that guy who was obsessed with my namesakes, yep. I turned down. And then a year and a half after that had ended and I had not done one thing professionally that was connected to it in any way, shape or form. The one thing, and I'm still gutted about this, the one thing I turned down, which I wish I'd done, because I, I didn't realise what it was it didn't exist at that time was who do you think you are oh. but the pitch letter when they wrote to me saying we're sure Dave would love to do this that are sort of mentioned because he went looking for his namesakes we think da 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 so I say no out of hand anything that mentions that I say yeah. no to and then the show comes on and I think that would have had nothing to do with that mm. and my parents would have loved it and it would mm. be brilliant but now you know now it's a huge show and I'm not big enough to, to be asked back or you know it's, it's gone but I turned down everything and then uh, just uh, let me go then what show was it that you uh, weren't <laughs> asked back on but who do you think you are who do you think you are but I think I'd rather enjoy that because yeah. uh, I think there'd a be lot very of few made near the potteries you're not wrong and Dave starts from the potteries BBC an excellent location however the potteries my are... point being 18 months Which after one? I had turned that, all that stuff down after it all ended there was a letter in the Daily Mirror from someone saying I've had enough of Dave Gorman all he ever does is talk about other Dave Gormans and it was like 18 months of me refusing every single offer about it I'd had one six part series about it that was this all I'd done this is where they would got the DVD and watched it five times in a row that day I have no idea like, when and will he sort of, stop and, it, and I can't escape it and I'm very proud of it as a show I'm not, I'm not sort of being all oh no I'm embarrassed by it I'm really proud of it but to, to persist in doing it would turn me into a character and a fake version whereas actually it was a true story mm. and I'm proud of it that Dave you haven't really done you're returning you, you've come back to stand up of late yes you now, did a really fascinating um, cycle tour didn't you uh, um, I, I, Sorry, that's I, a badly asked question. You did a cycle tour that I found fascinating. Yes, I did. That's thank you for, for uh, then that aiding wasn't a question. Me. That sorry, became a statement. Yeah, Do it again. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to know more about this cycle tour. It seems fascinating to me. Uh, thank you very thank much, you, Josie. Josie. Much um, yeah, you. no, I, uh, I, I, I stopped doing stand up. Or well, I stopped doing stand up years and years ago because I started doing these sort of storytelling shows instead. Mm -hmm. And in my head, there's a slight distinction mm -hmm. between the two. Um, so I. I last one I did I toured Google Wack for three years eight months a year away from home I toured twice around uh, America twice around Australia once in Canada and three times around Britain so wow. I like three three years of just being pretty much on the road can I ask you about that did you get lots of people giving you new ones the whole way through those tours like did the show become like three hours long no no because it was it was a story it was a thing so it right. wasn't about no, nothing new could be added to this true story okay. I did get lots of people sending me them but they couldn't be added to the show it, it wasn't, the wasn't a part of it um, so at the end of that I'd kind of lost some of the excitement of going on stage I'd, you know it was sort of one I really wanted to go home yeah. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to hang out at home yeah. and re-establish some friendships yeah it's you know, tricky, it's kind of like because it? actually it's not like being in a band where you're on the road with your mates yeah. you're on the road by yourself and I was in like in America on tour I was in each town for a week you don't make a really good friend in a week with someone who knows you're leaving town in and a week, you know, so I think a week like. is perfect. I <laughs> think it's about day five that they realise there's more foibles to me than they imagine. And yeah. then you're like, week, see ya. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's, you know, it's classic. It's the fugitive. It's Nicholas <laughs> Tobo. Yeah, it's yeah, incredible yeah. help. I mean, Banner seemed fine, but turning out, he's got aggressive foibles <laughs> and he leaves at exactly the right go, time. Yeah. Thanks, Banner. Fond memory, I, I, not but, longevity. Thing. But that's what I wanted, you know, I wanted to go home and, and reconnect and stuff. Yeah. And, and I no longer felt like there was anything exciting about going on stage because I've just been doing it so much mm. um, and I think you have to enjoy it because I think part, part of what an audience enjoys is you enjoying it you know yeah. I think it's important to, to want to do it rather than oh, I've got to pay my bills yeah. and stuff so I, I kind of stopped at that point doing anything live and I'd completely sort of disconnected myself from the world in which I could go and do 10 minutes 5 minutes 20 minutes because they were these long storytelling shows yeah. I hadn't written a sort of 
a discreet use it by itself joke I'd written everything I'd written was 90 minutes long mm. you know so I had no bits I could go and do so I couldn't really sort of go and do piece mill stuff and, and I just did other stuff I wrote and I did this and I presented stuff and you know I just sort of did other stuff instead and didn't feel the need and it was only when I went on tour on bike which wasn't it didn't start with a how can I go on tour conversation I did that thing that lots of people do as they're approaching 40 of thinking I can I'm going to prove I'm still virile and <laughs> you manly. still got it I'm going to do a bike ride you know how many you know most of the people doing Land's End to John O'Groats uh, every year and there are, there's there's three fat accountants doing it right now and another three setting off tomorrow you know it's a constant stream of people they're all around 40 and they're all men proving that they've still got it right and I was one of them right so I set off I wanted to do a, a big bike ride just for myself just for fun yeah and so I wanted I decided to go from the south southernmost point of Britain to the easternmost westernmost and northernmost and so that's what I was sort of doing and then a lot of people go all oh, right is it going to be a show about that is it going to be a book about that and that's that's kind of the assumption yeah, given just my like, past. You're doing something. So you I must be, write yeah. it up. And I was like, no, no, there isn't. And then I was talking to my manager, um, and he was going, well, why don't you do a tour while you're doing it? And I I had just I think I'd just reached the point where I'd started to go and do five minutes. I'd just started to like dip into stand up again. I'd got enough curiosity about it again mm. to kind of go back. So I was thinking about it, and I, I ended up sort of doing a thing where I, I, I said I'd do it under certain circumstances, kind of thinking it wouldn't be possible. I said I'll do it, but only if the route doesn't change. I'm not going to go on a sort of 90-mile detour because you found a really big venue that can we can sell some tickets in, and it has to be consecutive nights. I'm not going to hang around in one town for an extra day because the venue up the road isn't available for two or three days or whatever because I know if I lose momentum it'll fall apart I kind of need to do it every day I need to get on the bike and ride every day otherwise it'll all turn to shit and I thought well there's no way they'll be able to find venues all across the country that you used to look at most people's tour posters it's Aberdeen one night and Southampton the next yes and everyone goes why is that you crazy cats it's because that's when the fucking venues are open yeah 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 that's, that's because there's no in. reason why a venue in Lowestoft and a venue in Ipswich should have consecutive nights available if anything it you, makes less sense for them to do that yeah yeah and actually some of them have clauses in their contract where you're not allowed to play within 30 miles for a month or mm. something you know to kind of because they have uh, an audience they need to attract so I thought there's no way they'll be able to do that and then they started being able to do it <laughs> And actually, you know, north of Glasgow, it's we're kind of improvising anyway because it's all sort of school huts and, yeah. and village halls and, and things, you know. And it was it was really exciting. But that it was kind of that was when I went, okay, I've, I'm going to do that, and I will now commit. I have to write some stuff now. Mm. So I I did stand up again properly, doing one man shows of it, and discovered how much I like it again. Mm. And I'd not been doing it for six or seven years or something and really really excited about it in the same way I remember the first time I had an olive and liked it and thought wow I used to hate this these olives I didn't eat them for years and years and years and now all of a sudden I really love them and at some point during the last ten years I would have liked it and I've not been having it it can't be today isn't the day that I liked olives is it no my taste buds must have liked them three years ago four years ago five years who knows when I've wasted years of not eating olives Could have been doing and it was the same with stand up this is the other on bit now pizza. it's meant to be um, on the, the podcast if you look on the website it's doing this now eat olive now <laughs> eat olive now <laughs> right. but you know what I mean like, we'll if put your a thing at the beginning to make sure people have got a banana yeah. and an olive but yeah the if, you're, if your taste buds have changed how do you know at what point they changed mm. Like only by eating every, every day, every, every day. single yeah, yeah, day. Yeah. But you just know, really maybe big, once like, a month you should dish. be dipping in and going. These are the things I know I don't like. No, oh. I do that with mushrooms. Mushrooms are the only food that I just can't bear. I, really, the texture's repulsive. The taste is, ugh. and I keep trying. Like about once a year, I check That's in weird. with them, and once a year I'm like, "You've done it again." No, I how many mushrooms? I mean, what kind of mushrooms? Are you trying one mushroom once a year? Have you got a range of mushrooms? I mean, you're talking about you've got button mushrooms, you've got cut mushrooms, you've got woodland. Stop mushrooms. talking what about kind them because mushrooms? I'm. Ugh, I feel sick thinking about it. Now, Do this not bit... eat mushroom I now. I want to ask Dave Gordman another question, please. How much stuff did you take when you went on your bike ride? Because when I was 21, I cycled from Calais to Spain with my right. then boyfriend, and we had panniers. We had about three changes of clothes. Yeah. Roll mats. A te- no, we didn't even have roll mats. No, sorry. We had three changes of clothes, sleeping bags, a tent, bike kit, and that is all. <laughs> That's impressive. This is where no, it was I, stupid. No, we slept on the hard floor. I got a bit lucky because actually the decision to go, I'm going to turn it into a tour, led to help. 
because I then had a tour manager because oh. because especially we're doing like village halls and things yeah. where they had no sound system or whatever. He'd so we had a van a with a sound system and whatever going ahead of me. So I just threw my luggage in there. You were like a channel swimmer. Light. It was brilliant. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. So I got away with some stuff that I didn't, I wouldn't have done if it was just the bike ride. Oh, that's great. I also, because I wrote stuff in the show, I, initially I was going to be just one man and a mic stand up because because it was on a bike in my head it was like it has to be kind of lo-fi and yeah. stuff and then actually I started writing this stuff that involved PowerPoint so then in the I find final I can't get away from PowerPoint it's like I started and now it's like I need it every time I love time. it I love it but I did like so the final half hour I used to hide the screen and behind a curtain and so nobody would know there was a projector or whatever and in the like final half hour a curtain would drop and the screen was there and I'd filmed something from the first half that was then in the second oh, half in that's the PowerPoint a good trick. so there was sort of structural stuff going on and, yeah. and whatever um, that was my idea he didn't want to have PowerPoint and I said no one will accept you without PowerPoint <laughs> you said Robin Inch you're an idiot Robin Inch well they did because I, I, I was sort of quite proud of doing the first half an hour without PowerPoint just me and a mic so it was like that's that's an Edinburgh show already mm. and then there'd be an interval and then there'd be a second half and the final half of it would have Kind of like a real kick of energy. It was like having pudding at the end of a meal going, and it's a That's screen as said. well. It was like having pudding. I said that on the phone. <laughs> Eat pudding now. Um, <laughs> and the... it was, but that got me. That's why. So now I'm doing a whole show of PowerPoint because I've got excited about that again. But I, I wonder. Just going back to two of the early shows, because uh, yeah. I remember helping uh, pack envelopes for uh, Better World. Yes, uh, yes. When we were on tour together, yeah. and uh, I, I, was, I don't understand that. What does that Better mean? World was after reasons to be cheerful. Reasons. To, here's a brief resume of uh, David uh, Gorman's career. Uh, began as a comedy po- poet. Uh, <laughs> went on to uh, write for award-winning selection of TV shows, uh, predominantly based in Manchester. Uh, moved on from stand-up after selection of student tours to write a show entirely based around Ian Jury's Reasons to be Cheerful Part 3 song followed awesome. by Better World in which could he improve the world by getting uh, uh, basically putting letters in uh, local newspapers asking people's suggestions then the career really began for Dave Gorman <laughs> and um, this is th- the thing that I suddenly realised though those things where you couldn't really do Are You Dave Gorman now in, no, in no, some ways no, there's no. a brilliant piece of time where Are You Dave Gorman that was the cusp of the internet existed but I would say within one year yeah. people would go and the same way Google Whack now I would imagine in the period of time that's passed because there is now so much content on the internet absolutely it, yeah, yeah. so th- this to me is an in- intriguing they're very much of their of time yeah and there was a thing um, the, QI has its uh, uh, Twitter thing Wikipedia. Mm. And they tweeted a link this morning to a website called you're not me dot com. Oh, I love that website. Yeah, which searches the the UK electoral register for other people with your name. It has a grammatical error built in. Yes, you can't have an I apostrophe love it. in. You're in a, not me. Yeah, the not me belongs to you. Yeah. Mm. Um, but because they tweeted it this morning, then like a dozen people tweet me going, oh, this would have been useful, wouldn't it? Whereas actually, I'm not saying that with any kind of oh, those people saying that. They're sort of joining in with the conversation, and, and I understand the connection and whatever. But the truth is, had that existed, it wouldn't have even happened. Yeah. The assumption they're making is that that was on telly, so it must have been done on purpose to be on telly. Whereas actually, it was on telly because it happened. Yeah. And then yeah. we told you about it. Mm. It's the other way around, and and that's kind of. It's always contrary to people's instinct. It's, you know, it's a kind of. I guess this is similar to to the kind of creationist argument of, well, I exist and the world's lovely, so it must be a gift for me. Anything that's on telly must be made to be on telly. It doesn't make any sense that somebody would tell a story after the event. Yeah, yeah. You know, but that that is what it is. And if if you're not me, it existed. The initial conversation that sparked the true events that are in that show would have been, this is true. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. I tell you what, I'll look it up. Right, it is. Who wants a drink? And there would have been nothing else. Well, it wouldn't have happened. I see. I talk to my friends about this because we often have arguments where they go, "Well, you know, it's no fun spe- speculation anymore." Because every- Robin is dropping custard cream after Drop literally a now. years Drop of abuse your biscuit at my now. <laughs> But literally after years of abuse of my snacking, <laughs> Robin is fumbling like an old drunk. Do you know why? Do you know why? Oh, I'm just because going to eat a cream. I presumed that because they bought you an apple and banana, which you requested, you'd be eating both of them all the way through the podcast like normal. I did not 
realise that you were stealing from this recording show an app you don't even want for I'm now, gonna which have you it placed in a almost minute. immediately into your bag to take away with you. That is not the rules of recording studio. You are only allowed to eat food that they've given you in this. If the Apple alarm okay, goes off and have... we go out, okay. I'm going to look like a fucking idiot. But I'm taking all to... these pencils, though. <laughs> oh, you're always allowed to take the pencils. I'm taking all of them. I'm taking all of them. This recording studio used to get a nice selection of the kind of biscuits you get in Golden Wrapper. Now it's custard creams and fruit shortcake, the kind of thing that are undunkable. You used to have pens, purple pens. Now it's pencils. Guys. Yeah. And some of the a... rubbers have come off the end of the pencil. I'll tell you what, if upstairs they're probably doing a big interview with someone really, <laughs> like, they, they always get a lot of, lot of, you know, Duran Duran have been here to record right, an interview, for right. instance. I call them right? Duran Duran. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> And I bet they would have gone, check the pencils before Duran Duran come in, make sure they've all still got their erasers on the end, otherwise it'd be embarrassing for the yeah. recording studio. Well, oh, there this Americans is just some comedy crap, just put in the worst pencils. OK, now... Anyway, what's your saying, question? And I hope it's a question this time, Joe, so not off these sentences you can remember. do it. What was I saying a minute ago? I have no idea. Something Nobody about cares. you. It was not about me. I hate the world. You said you and your friends have an argument. Oh, yes, yes. Me and my friends often have arguments whereby uh, they go, the thing is, you know it's just no fun anymore because you don't sit and speculate and you just google it and I think no what happens is we're talking about a film or something I IMDB it then we find out that that person was also in an even more obscure ridiculous thing yeah, yeah. we get to find out more and more facts like it's just and also you can't fully rely uh, but on their factual nature you have to either. learn so, your, how to use sources quite it, well on the internet exactly it's not that trust. great though the it's internet. exciting it's as exciting it's nothing a different game nothing was as good as when we were on tour and I was staying at Dave's flat and he'd had a terrible week because David just had his nipples pierced oh no and one of his can I mention this wow, story I love this I don't even know what it is so of course this you can wonderful yeah, yeah. stories Dave it would have been late 20s I suppose sorry early 20s if you management are listening <laughs> and um you had your, your nipple pierced, you decided to have your nipple pierced, and then you came in while we were on tour and you went, it's just fallen out. As if your own body was rejecting the idea of rebellion through piercing. Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your pierce slowly just, the body was pushing out till it just popped off the end of the nipple, landed, I think, in the shower, and that was it. I wasn't in the shower at the time. Dave just came out and said, no, what my happened? nipple ring's fallen <laughs> off. And this is, this is a terribly sad indictment of me. Um, my pierced nipple used to be in the beginning of the show Better World because it was part of the series of events that led to that show happening. It was part of it. And so I I'd, I'd toured that show quite a lot and I had my pierced nipple. And they'd pierced it with some metal that wasn't even... It wasn't surgical steel, it was something... No, it was. The first one was surgical steel. And unbeknownst to me, it had been moving ever so slightly forward, just like millimetre by millimetre over over time. And then one day... It fell up like no scar. I've got, I have a, a slightly distended left nipple with a horizontal scar across it, but it didn't, there was no blood, there was no, it didn't sort of get ripped through. It was like the film of skin that was holding it on just disappeared and it fell off. And my first thought was, oh, that's ruined the start of that show. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually got it re pierced <laughs> no! in, in sobriety. So to something, be authentic. Something that had happened in drunken stupidity. Because it then became a part of a show, I then recreated in full soberness in order to re-establish that part of the show, which makes me an awful, awful no, human being. you've got to admire your commitment to your art. Yeah, I, know, I no longer have it. Inability to it. accept the idea. You are. This is what your body was saying. You are Dave Gorman. You are not the... You were a man who, when you first went on circuit, was in cardigan. It's like if I yeah, had yeah, a tattoo, yeah. it would slowly erase itself yes. because it would go, you're Robin Ince who goes to libraries. We know the tattoos mm. of W.H. Alden, which, frankly, we weren't that keen on. Well, at least yeah, so. as you get wrinklier, it, it, join, it becomes more like him. I I was thinking about that very same thing because I don't drink very much. I drink... Like, if I go out... Uh, I don't really go out. Don't but, like, I will drink at parties, you know, for fun. Yeah. I enjoy myself, but I don't drink in the week. And I really wanted not to be like that. For, like, a, f a couple of years, I really wanted to kind of be a bit more gung-ho and a bit more party. And I didn't like... You know, I think it was a reaction to people thinking that I was super twee. But... I am super tweet. There's nothing I can do about it. Like, I like going home and reading. That's what I like. It's not an affectation. and It's tricky, isn't it? You weren't that super tweet at Glastonbury. No, I was not. I had a great time. You were very poorly the next day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact you just gave me a sign of don't say anymore, and I wasn't going to say anymore. Now, that's... Uh, However, no, what I was going to say is before my, the my internet... My interest peaked. We, uh... Well, it's peaked exactly. There's no <laughs> more now. Go on down here. <laughs> the, um... Uh, it, before the internet... There was. I can't believe how seriously I looked at you. I was like, "You dare!" Yeah. No way! If you mention what happened in that stone circle <laughs> and those men in that wagon, 
That's simply anyway, not true. Anyway, it was just a reenactment society. That's all. Wow, what a reenactment. Anyway, <laughs> when I really... see round heads, oh, hey, stop me. It's the Battle of Naseby. <laughs> anyway, the... Uh... I'm like the city of Gloucester. You can't get in unless you bring a pig. <laughs> Right. The uh, anyway, that's it. We pretty much now. Oh, we no. We that's fine. We're gonna. Oh, jo, what did you want to mention? Josie's got a thing she's brought with her. So, um, six months ago, when I was writing for your uh, Christmas gigs, Robin, I um, was watched a documentary about the Black Panthers, and it made me realise how much what I'd known about them was just um, propaganda. And I spoke about it on this podcast. And after I was talking about them at a gig, a woman came up to me and said. I run the campaign to free the Angola Three, two of whom have now been freed. I think. I'm sorry if I'm ill-informed. I know I've got the internet. I'm sorry. Um, and Charlie she Drake. Said, well, no, hang on. That's the wrong <laughs> bit of the internet. <laughs> she said you can write to. Oh, she said you can write to Kenny Zuli Whitmore, uh, who is still in Angola prison. He's been there for 30 years on trumped-up charges. And um, it was after UK and Cut had been really rubbished in the media. There was this one week where everyone was slagging them off and lying about them. And my heart was broken because UK and Cut are like, they're my team, man. They're the greatest. And um, I wrote him this letter saying, I know that what I'm doing is really, really small fry. And I know that I'm just like really middle class. But please, please, will you give me some help? Because I don't know how to keep going. And he wrote me this fantastic letter. And I got it last week, which my life has been a little bit tricky of late. And... Um, it was brilliant. He's written, he wrote me a supplementary one as well. And uh, I'll, I'm going to read this for people who feel... I might read this in my show as well, so if you come and see it... Just go out during this bit. Just go out to yeah. have a flag. There'll, there'll be a bar somewhere. you probably hate me anyway. This is the internet. Oh, you're really political for a woman. Yeah. <laughs> what a shame you're not funny. Oh, I don't like women comedians. You're all right. Oh, do you think I would have liked that? <laughs> OK, here we go. To answer your questions of advice, uh, how do you keep going? Slowly. But study, push for the change that you want to see come about. Change does not come easy or happen overnight. If it's something worth fighting for, just choose your own pace, but never give up when despair sets in. Just take a step back, then get going again and stay conscious. So, Josie, take all of your anger and turn it into positive action. You can do it. My first step back in the 1970s was when I got tired of talking about how bad the cops, police, was messing over people and did something to change it. And I do not regret my decisions. And believe me, Josie, sometimes I have those days when despair sets in and I say to hell with this. The next day I'm right back in there doing what I love to do. He's been in prison for 30 years and he's been in solitary confinement for like 28 years. And when I read it, I, um, like I'm stunned to get it. And, and I know it's advice that I suppose anyone would know that was the advice that you get is you just keep going. But it's been fantastic. And then at the end he says, take care and stay focused. Long live you, cow and cut. Power to the people, Zulu. And um, I was amazing. He's also sent me some leaflets about the Black Panthers, some of their literature that they used to publish, and it's really wonderful. And um, I wanted to say, uh, for what it's worth, if everyone listening to this could go on his campaign website, which I think is called freezulu.com, there's loads of little things you could do. And if you write him a letter, he'll write back, and he seems like a very, very kind, uh, generous man who was uh, quite remarkable, really. Anyway, I know it's really serious, but that's what I brought in deal with it motherfuckers um, yeah it's really humbling isn't it I, I like, and I know it's just advice that anyone would, well I don't even know but just thinking that man's been in prison for 30 years and he's still saying I do not regret a single decision that I made it's like it's astonishing anyway very serious you may well, want to say something really trivial and I don't mean to undercut it go on go, go for it that's what we need. hasn't he got lovely handwriting he has got lovely handwriting very straight yeah you've been listening to Robin Ince's Utter Shambles brought to you by Comedy Central with wow. Lucy Long Oh wow! So I'm not even. Yeah, part no, of I've the taken you out. Anymore. You were in it on the script, but because you were so rude to me, it's nothing to do with you anymore. I this don't podcast know whether was... I'm insulted or relieved. So. Oh, why don't you just go and hang out with Andrew Collins at Six Music? I oh, don't start that. Could people oh, stop abusing you. me on the internet, please? I am a nice person, and I am not famous. You can avoid. Do you know me. what? These aren't the people to plead to if they've chosen to listen to this. In, well, they might I, just you be never know. Though, whenever they yeah. hear me, they go, "Oh, there's yeah. that stupid cunt." They might be some of those angry Dave Gorman fans. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who is Dave Gorman? <laughs> this podcast was produced by Adrian McKinder and edited by Mike Pell. For more comedy podcasts, visit ComedyCentral.co.uk/podcasts.